from inflation. Uh, we've also included for your benefit the estimated royalty deposits for FY18, FY19. These are courtesy of the Department of Revenue's fall forecast at the 25% uh, amounts. Got a question from Representative Guerra. Thank you. Um, the um, so, so just on this royalty deposit part, um, or originally it was twenty five percent of all royalty all royalties should be de shall be deposited into the permanent fund, and then uh, when things were going well in maybe the nineties, they said for some newer fields. Um, for the newer fields, 50% shall go into the fund. And then Representative Rokeberg, when things were going poorly in their early 2000s, I think passed a bill that said, no, even for those new fields, let's go back to 25%. But but uh, at least that was the understanding of many of the people in the building, but that didn't happen. So I guess the question for you is for those, those then newer fields, the ones that now are 50% go into the fund, by changing it back to 25% for all, which is those asterisks, I think. Do you know uh, what difference that makes? So if you went down to 25% going back into the fund, what would that leave for the general fund on average? Do you, do you know? And if you don't know, that's okay. No, through the chair, Representative Guerra, we don't track, because we don't keep, we don't get that type of information. We don't track it by field or lease type. We just get a lump sum amount from Department of Natural Resources and and we use the Department of Revenue's forecast. And then can you explain why you didn't invest in Bitcoins? Just <laughs> 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 well, it would have helped. So, no. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, All right. Representative Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I just want a little clarification. When you say that it's in the governor's operating budget, is he um, talking about putting 16, 17, 18, and 19 all in it, or just the $943 million? Uh, through the chair, Representative Wilson, he has in his proposed budget two appropriations, one for the total of 16, 17, and 18, and a second appropriation for fiscal year 19. And a follow-up, Mr. Chairman? Follow-up. And so what would it mean to the permanent fund if, I mean, right now we aren't doing the inflation proofing, but what would happen if we also took out the royalty deposits? How would that impact? <coughs> Besides uh, just the loss of money, which we know. Through the chair, Representative Wilson, you, I assume you mean anything over the 25% because you can't violate the Constitution by taking the 25% back. Um, and that's already happening. So I don't know what the difference would be as to what we would have gotten had we gotten the full amount uh, that we had gotten in the past. Uh, that's information for Department of Natural Resources and Department of Revenue. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, please proceed. Okay. So um, slide 10 gives you an idea of just how much in unrealized gain has been added to the permanent fund uh, and to our assets under management between the accounts. So currently in the principal of the account, we have approximately $40 billion in contributions and $8.7 billion in unrealized gain. If we turned and sold and realized every single one of those dollars, $8.7 billion would be transferred to the earnings reserve account. So that's to give you a sense of how much is due to that pro rata share being bought by the principal investments, but how it does not contribute to the amount available to invest by the principal. The earnings reserve account has attributed to it $12.6 billion uh, in its uh, amount and 2.7 of unrealized gain. So for a total of about 15.3 billion already marked into the earnings reserve account with a nod towards the additional 8.7 billion if that sustained and there were no losses that came in, in the meantime before those were realized. <coughs> Uh, looking to the actual balance sheets, uh, I, I find it helpful because this is something that we post monthly on our website. 
And there's always a lot of really good information that is here as well. These are unaudited through December 31st, 2017, compared to where we started the fiscal year. So you'll see that we have total assets have increased from 60.5 billion up to 64.4 billion in six months. We have, you can see where the majority of that has come from preferred and common stock, which is our public equity bucket. In this, you can also see that we continue to book for inflation proofing an amount based on the statutory formula. Given um, the, uh, given how the dividend has been uh, negotiated over the last couple of cycles, our auditors have recommended that we not book anything for the dividend on an, as an ongoing liability. Uh, we have also down here, you can see that that realized earnings have increased by about a billion dollars along with the unrealized appreciation in un uninvested assets. Finally, if you're looking over at the uh, fund balances, that non-spendable, here's where you can see the 40 billion, which comes from contributions and appropriations, along with the not in spendable form because it's unrealized gain, uh, net realized gain of 8.7 billion. And assigned for future appropriations is where you see the earnings reserve account balances. A question from uh, Representative Seaton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's been some discussion on inflation proofing, and um, there's uh, been discussion in various parameters that the um, that there's automatic inflation proofing because of the investments and that they're growing, and therefore there's. Mm -hmm. Would you like to, or would you please explain for the general public exactly what that parameter means or how those discussions um, could be considered? Um, I'd be happy to. If you go back to the previous slide, I think this probably gives you the best example of how that works. So if all of these, if these two uh, accounts, principal and earnings reserve account, were combined and you looked at the investments, um, or let's just take the principal. We don't even need to combine them. Let's just take the principal. That growth of $8.7 billion that is coming in, realize, in unrealized gain has attached to it that concept you said of inflation. So there are investments that we make that naturally embed inflation in them. Real estate is, is a prime example where if you buy something, if you buy a piece of property and it grows in value, it's embedding the notion of inflation over that time period. It's not like a fixed income bond that you buy at a certain price and its value will it's, it's reinvestment value. It loses value with, in high inflation. So if you look at this, you would say, oh, our principal has increased to $48.7 billion, except that the principal of the fund is not entitled to any of that inflation gain. And so to make sure that the $40 billion, which is coming directly from the non-renewable resource, that has been preserved for current and future generations of Alaskans to make sure that those future generations of Alaskans get the same benefit that current generations get from that 40 billion, we need to put back some of that gain. And the way we do it is through inflation proofing into the corpus of the fund. So following up, Mr. Oh. So there's also been discussion of we're inflation proofing inflation. In other words, if the unrealized value has increased by $8.7 billion and now we're inflation proofing 
that number as well as the uh, invested amount. Does that, um, how is that discussion taking place that, you know, you've incorporated something of inflation within the fund and now we're making a calculation that we're going to inflation proof that, even though it's unrealized gain, uh, in the calculation and we're adding that portion in? Um, through the chair, we are only calculating inflation on the $40 billion. We're not calculating it on the unrealized gain. So we're not inflation proofing inflation okay. at all. Representative Gehr. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Rodell, just, I don't know how to call you CEO Rodell, which is really <laughs> what your title is. You Everybody else is either director or commissioner. <laughs> um, um, the, uh, I'll just call you CEO Rodell, that's what you are. Um, on page nine, um, uh, um, I mean, I think it's pretty cut and dry. Um, if you look at years 2011 through 2015, you had inflation proofing and then the deposits from the 25% royalty were about the same as inflation proofing. So you got additions to the permanent fund to grow it from the deposits and about the same amount, what some people call double inflation proofing, but about the same amount from inflation proofing. Um, and then... There can't be any finger pointing going around, around between any of us. Um, this, the Senate and, and this side said last year we couldn't afford it, but that didn't start last year, the no inflation proof of thing. That started two years before this majority formed. So for the last three years, whether it was with us or um, under the prior legislatures, it's been three years since there's been any inflation proofing. Is that, that that's correct, right? That's correct. Okay. And that. And your preference is that not go on forever, right? Uh, through the chair, Representative Zer Gare, a couple things. One, um, I, I think that the wealth that the fund has created over the last two years, putting some of that back into the corpus through infl the inflation proofing mechanism is important. I think, two, I don't, um, I, I want to make sure that people don't confuse royalty deposits as inflation proofing. Royalty deposits are the non-renewable resource coming in and being saved for future generations of Alaskans. It is not inflation proofing the fund. Sure. And through the chair, and I get that. I think we all agree we want to grow the fund. <coughs> yeah. That's the, it's the conundrum we're dealing with this in last session until we have a fiscal plan. Representative Wilson. Yes, Mr. Chairman, this is a question to you. Can we have DNR um, in to help us understand, or to help me at least understand, how we went from 600 million to 285, 365, just to see whether or not it has to do with the 25 percent, or we were giving more and now we're not? Prices. Oh, just, prices. Yeah, just it wouldn't hurt to have it completely explained. I don't see anybody in revenue here, and we'll make sure that we. Uh, we get that question addressed, though. Um, Jane, if you could take note of that. Uh, please proceed. All right. So moving on to the changes in fund balance on slide 12, this is really the activity of the corporation, of the permanent fund, over the last six months um, and for the month. And as I said, you'll see where money starts to come in. Uh, we received interest income of 224 million. We received dividends. This is corporate stock dividends, that type of dividends of $310 million for six months. Real estate, this is other income of the fund. So think of this as regularized income that you would expect to see uh, so to, to the tune of almost $711 million. And then we have the increase or decrease in the fair value of investments. And this goes to that question you had earlier, Representative Ortiz, about the difference between accounting income and statutory net income. So you'll see that we recognize the change in fair value over the six months and the big boost that the bull market has given the public equity portfolio to the tune of two point six billion dollars just in six months ending December 31st. Uh, you'll also see the amounts that have flown out of the corporation, uh, out of the fund for operating expenditures. These are both for our 
corporate expenditures as well as the external management, uh, and then other legislative appropriations. These other legislative appropriations are the monies that we pay to DNR to collect our share of royalty um, and things like that uh, to Department of Law, uh, et cetera. Uh, the transfers in and out, you'll see 726 million went out. That was for payment of the dividend. Almost all of it was for the payment of the permanent fund dividend. Uh, and then that shows you how that changes the overall fund balance, getting that income over six months. And then below that in the box, you'll see the calculation of statutory income. So we add back, the, we make the adjustments for the unrealized uh, gains. So we add back losses, subtract out gains, and we end up with a net number for six months of $2.4 billion in statutory net income. Yes. We had a question, Representative Pruitt. Yeah, thank you, uh, Director Rodell. A uh, question I have is, of course, related to um, the currency um, uh, piece that you have up there and the loss associated with that. Fairly sizable for the year ending June 30th of 17. Is that, is that because the cash that we have on hand due to inflationary forces that are out there lost value? Is it because we had investments outside of the United States that their value changed because of uh, changes in currencies comparison to what, where the U.S. dollar is. What, what, what is, what is the um, kind of the detail behind that particular line? Uh, through the chair, Representative Pruitt, that's a really good question. The, the currency line that you're seeing here is the effect of having investments outside in non-US dollar denominated currencies. And when you have a very strong dollar, that tends to widen. And so you'll see more losses as the value of the dollar goes up, depending on when you buy in. And when the value of the dollar starts to come down, you'll see either gains or losses um, equivalent to that. So what you're seeing is the effect of the global portfolio. And we book, um, and now I'm, I was going to make a statement and I want to double check, but we do have in our annual report, in our financial statements, you'll see a note disclosure that tells you the 40 plus currencies that we're exposed to and what each of those exposures has contributed or subtracted from on this line. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Please proceed. So one of the questions we get asked a lot is, so how do, how do we invest? Um, and it starts with the Board of Trustees. And as for the fiduciaries to the fund, the trustees have a duty to Alaskans in assuring that the fund is managed and invested in a manner consistent with the legislative findings uh, that created the corporation. Those legislative findings are that the permanent fund should provide a means of conserving mineral resources to benefit all generations of Alaskans, that the permanent fund's goal should be to first maintain safety of principle while maximizing total return, and finally, that the fund should be used as a savings device to allow the maximum use of disposable income for the purposes designated. Alaska Statutes 3713-120 mandate the investment responsibility, and they mandate that we use the prudent investor investment rule. So as fiduciaries of the fund, the Board of Trustees has the full authority to make investment decisions. They provide to the corporation the authority to invest within certain bands. So if we get outside of certain bands, we have to come back to the full board. They approve a target asset allocation and they adopt the investment policy. Uh, my job is to assure that the strategies adopted by the board are then successfully implemented. One of the first things I had to do when I took this job was to hire a chief investment officer his responsibility is to make those strategic and tactical allocations to allow the fund to grow in value. And finally, he relies on individual portfolio managers who are responsible for the investment and performance of each individual asset class. So the target, port target allocation for fiscal year 18 
uh, is as follows. 39% target allocation to public equities, 22% allocation to fixed income plus. Those are the tradable liquid, uh, truly liquid portions of the permanent fund. That comprises as of about 60%, uh, 61% of the total assets under management are in those two allocations. As of Quarter two, fiscal year 18, we had $64 billion invested. So what I'd like to do right now is to walk through uh, each of the asset classes and give you a sense of that management, the cost, the amount that each of the portfolio managers is responsible for. So in public equities, and I'm going to tie this back to our fiscal year audited figures rather than trying to... Um, come forward to December 31st, because this is all within the annual report. But public equities, we had as of, we had $26.1 billion uh, on, on June 30th, 2017. To give you a sense of size, this was the size of the entire fund 10 years ago. So our director of public equities oversees an internal team of two, and he oversees 28 external managers with strategies, whether in US domestic, global funds, or international funds. He holds quarterly meetings with each manager.